Again, out of your Bibles, that's Matthew 22, 34 to 40. The greatest commandment. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the, greatest, the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Good evening. This is a sermon that you've heard before, most likely, in that I preached it here before. It has actually been almost exactly a year since I preached this sermon. As just by off by just a few weeks, it's been a year since I first came here, since I first came here to preach. But I was trying to think on what to preach, what to preach a sermon on, and maybe it was in part out of laziness, uh, so I didn't have to write something new. But I was told, I was, I was given the advice, what you need to preach on really ought to be what you feel you need to be preached to about. What you need to hear is what you need to preach. And this is what came to mind. Considering the sister verse to what it is that was just read, Mark chapter 12, verse 29 through 31. And I, I, I may use this verse primarily because it has an extra word in it. It says, And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like it, namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. I thought that I was selfless. I thought that I was a, selfish, a selfless person. I gave my time to other people. I always dropped what I was doing to help friends in need when they said they needed help. I gave my money to strangers on streets corners when I thought I could spare it. I gave up two years of my life to study the Word of God, and an instructor looked at me dead in the eye and said, you are selfish. And I nearly scoffed, because I could hardly believe what he was saying. So much so that when I realized he was right, I wept. During the second century, during the second century, the man developed the idea, the geocentric model of the universe, the idea that the Earth was in the middle. Convenient. Where are humans? Where is man on the earth? We like to think ourselves as the center of everything. Until the 16th century, this was a very common thought, and around the 16th century was the, the idea of the heliocentric model, the, the idea that the earth revolved around the sun rather than the other way around. And that idea was actually considered to be entirely against Scripture. And people who, were, who believed such things were ostracized by the church at large. People refused to hear it. We, know that, we now know the truth that man is not the center of the universe. And I'm unconvinced that the long fight for the heliocentric model of the universe is unrelated to a self-centeredness, which is, in fact, unscriptural. God is mentioned in the first and last sentence of the canonical scriptures that we have. From the beginning, it was the design that he should be not only in the forefront of our minds, but the center of our life, a sort of theocentric model, a God-centered model. Our all-powerful God has always worked in the background when man has gone astray but always brought attention back around to him as the center of our lives, as the tabernacle was the actual center of 
the Hebrew camp, the tabernacle being God's dwelling place. In every model of religious thought given to us by Jehovah, he is either at the center of our lives or the highest tier of a hierarchy in family, in the church, and in our behavior. The base principle of this, Mark 12, 30 through 31, is the first and great commandment. Love the Lord thy God. In Greek, that is, that is hotheos agape estin. That, well, that means, forgive me, that was 1 John 4, 8. But it means God is love. If God is love, how do you love love? How do you love the embodiment of what love is? I always thought that love was an emotion, that love is something that you feel, and, that lo and to give love, I'm getting around myself. I thought that if I loved someone or something, it was because I had an emotion from them. The love, the love is a topic all that is a sermon series all on its own, not just a single sermon. But the understanding I want to give is from, the one, from, from this one point, agape, what agape is. That is the word used for love here. It is love that, re that requires action. This is excessive goodwill towards somebody. This is the love that leads to Christ that led Jesus Christ to die on the cross for us. It is so much more than a feeling. In fact, it has nothing to do with feeling. It is action. Loving the Lord cannot be superficial. It is not balancing ourselves between the gray areas, between what is right and what it is that we want to do. Loving God doesn't mean that we stay in a perpetual state of, I promise God, this is the last time that I do this. I promise that was the last time. And it doesn't mean making God a priority only when he is on our minds. Can you imagine if we loved our children the way that we tend to love God? Can you imagine? Imagine spending time with your child maybe once or twice a week and talking to them for about 15 seconds before every meal. And that was it. Would that child feel loved? I don't think they would. It goes beyond our worship on Sundays with the congregation. It goes beyond our Wednesday Bible studies. It is more than visiting the widows and the orphans in their affliction and giving money to strangers. It is so much more. Above all, it is neither optional nor anything less than all-inclusive. If you love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. To what extent do we keep his commandments? How far do we push ourselves? Or rather, how far do we push past ourselves? With all thy heart. The Greek word translated heart is cardia. That might sound familiar. Billy Terry is having trouble with tachycardia. Tachycardia, it means of a rapid heart rate, a rapid heart. Cardia being the word heart. But this doesn't refer necessarily to the organ in the Greek. It refers to thoughts or feelings. Also by analogy, the middle, the center. Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Who can know it? Without guidance from God, it will lead us astray. Those who are married, consider how many times did you pray, God, please let me be with her, this, this, this woman that isn't your wife now. And how many times after, afterwards when those relationships ended, do you, did you think to yourself, wow, I am sure glad that prayer wasn't answered. Those who have been unlucky enough to experience that, were your hearts right? Your desires, were they right? Of course they weren't. Trusting our hearts to him, giving our desires to him, is putting, our, is putting aside our wants, and that is the key to this, to this phrase, with all thy heart. I suspect that it is by no accident that this is the first of the human aspects listed with which we are to give God, we are to love God in full. Before we can give devotion to God in any other way, if it is to be of 
any effect, we have to take our own desires, our own feelings, and put them aside. And make him the focus. It's interesting to note that the, one of the translations of the word cardia is middle, or center. Your center is to be given up to God. That part of you that the world revolves around? Yeah, that. That's what you're supposed to give up. Better yet, you're supposed to replace it. Replace it with Him. Go from being centered on yourself and being centered on God. With that, we're brought back to that theocentric model of self. The thought is summed up in, the, in this verse. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 through 21. So love the Lord your God with all thy heart. And with all thy soul. The word translated soul is suki. It's strangely where we get the word psyche. But it means breath or vitality. It doesn't mean the, the abstract idea of well, whatever it is we think a soul is. It means breath or vitality. The word is used to describe the life force that does inhabit all living things from animals to plants. See, once God has your heart, next is your breath. Next is the reason that you are alive and the very first gift that he ever gave man, our breath. When a believer is baptized, his life is given to God. I don't know about you, but it took me five or six years for all that to sink in all the way. When a believer is baptized, he leaves his previous master, who he thought was himself, but in reality was the sinful world. And he serves the Lord. He serves his new master. Man must make a choice. It's either God or the world. Or as we might see, it's either God or ourselves. Our vitality is the first and most precious gift from God to man. What a blessing it is to be alive, but how dare we take it for ourselves, like a greedy child who runs off with a treat that was just given to him with no suggestion of gratitude for what it is that he received. We're better than that. Do you think that might also include our words? I think it would. So love the Lord your God with all thy soul, your breath. And love the Lord thy God with all thy mind. The word translated mind, dianoia, means deep thought, means imagination. Of course, again, mind and understanding. Loving God with our minds means devoting our conscience to him. From our dreams, our aspirations and idle thoughts, to our heavy reasoning and the training of our minds and education. We have a duty to God to understand and to study His Word, searching with intensity until it is that we have the answer to the questions that we might come up with, or the answer to the questions that others might come to us with. We have a duty to rein in our imaginations and focus on godly ambitions, to make even our automatic responses in thought rely upon His Word. We have a duty to put forth every mental effort into developing our minds as Christians. God has given us the ability and the right to enjoy arts and fiction, and, but we are given, but are we giving the first fruits of our minds to God? Or are we taking those first fruits for ourselves? Are we growing as people? Are we depending on the understanding of, are we deepening our understanding of spiritual things? Are we still unsure where the Bible says that baptism is necessary for salvation? Do we know who Deborah was? Or understand what the book of Hebrew means when it speaks of the spiritual tabernacle? These are just examples, and I am guilty of these things. And I've spent at least two years in intense study of Scripture. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our mind and also with all of our strength. The word strength, iscus, though some have suggested it refers to the body, as I originally had thought, it actually means force, power, 
Avail available, available force. It means ability. Loving God with all of one's strength is to put all of one's available effort into work for Him. All effort that, we, that is necessary to complete the work He has put before us. To deny God our full active effort is illogical and it's an affront to His promise. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. That means we're not going to run out of strength so long as what we're going for or what He needs, what He desires, what He has for us to do. We might feel too tired to get going, but we'll have the strength to do what He has us set to do. In fact, the word there, do, in I can do all things, that word is iscus. That word is the strength. That word is ability. That is the strength which we are to give all of to God. All that we can do. There is not a single promise from God, however, that does not come with some stipulation or prerequisite that is necessary for us to take full advantage of it. It is reasonable to assess that the stipulation for this promise in Philippians 4.13 is that we are already willing to put forth all the strength that we have for His sake. We have to be put, put forth all of our reasonable effort for His sake, and we will be strengthened. Not before. God has always required us to do what we are able to do before He steps in. Every single time. It's a quality that is seen even in the plan of salvation. We hear, we believe, we repent, we confess, and then we are baptized and God acts on us. And our sins are washed away. And then it's up to us again to continue on running until it is we run out of strength or run out of patience and wisdom and then we ask for more. And He gives us what it is that we need to keep running. We still have to keep moving. So likewise, where our strength is sufficient, it is up to us to succeed. This is the reason that Paul spoke, saying, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distressions for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. It is in our insufficiencies that God shows himself to be all-sufficient. But through our sufficiencies that we express our love and devotion to him. We are to love the Lord, our God, with all of our strength. And we are to love the Lord... Sorry, that's the end of that one. We're also to love thy neighbor as thyself. Loving thy neighbor as thyself, this means after you have given all things to God, what he gives back to you in time and effort does not go to you. It goes to your neighbor what your neighbor needs. After then, there may be found time for pleasure. A lack of neighbor love becomes a lack of love for God. And it all boils down to that, really. Where any man lacks spiritually, ultimately he lacks in proper love and respect for the Almighty. He has placed himself first, before work, before responsibilities, before worship and prayer, before others, before the care of his charges, before God. He has lied to himself, convincing his own mind that he really would put God first, meaning when God comes to mind. To a true Christian, God is always at the forefront. To honor him is always a primary effort, which, periphery, which peripherates all aspects of life and in all aspects of self, that is, mind, body, soul, strength, it is not a matter of self-discipline, but a matter of self-denial. And I hate that the most. It is a matter of putting God and His values first. It is a matter of showing our mind to be God-centered. And it comes down again to a denial of self. How many times in Scripture does, one, uh, does it say to deny oneself? According to Scripture, we have to deny ourselves in submission to authority. 1 Peter 2.13 and, and verse 24, as well as Hebrews 13.17. In respect to those who are elder, 1 Peter 5.5. 5. Deny yourself to one's spouse, Ephesians 5.22 and 25. 
putting first even the well-being of those who would hurt you. Luke chapter 6, verse 27 through 29, and then giving up our own plans. James chapter 4, verse 13 through 17. James 4, verse 7 reads, Submit, therefore, uh, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If submission to God is resistance against the devil, then to submit instead to one's own self instead of God's will, and even the subtlest of ways, is to submit to the devil instead. And man cannot serve two masters. Luke 16, 13. We must deny ourselves, even as Christ denied himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. I had, I had learned that a Christian is on time. Beyond this, he is early when it is convenient for others. He puts all of his self into his work, producing fruit for the kingdom in every form that he can. A Christian shows respect for authority and the rules set in place by them. And a Christian holds to every aspect of every agreement that does not stand contrary to the teachings of Christ. For a Christian, there is no acceptable excuse for failure. In his book, Christian, uh, Christian Personal Ethics, Carl Henry wrote, None other can be more hypocritical than one who pleads conscience to further his own cause. It's not about building up the will or setting into habit first. Those things will happen as a direct result, a direct, direct result of a tenacious attitude that he has taken towards all things pertaining to life and godliness. In no place does the Bible give allowance for time in, a, in the manner of self-improvement? Nowhere. And again, I said before, I really hate that. The message seems to, be, seems to ring out rather clear from the text. It's just do the work. Just do the work. The commands are not grievous. These burdens are not too much for you. It is a wonder that we have become deaf to the tones of that bell when we ought to be like Pavlov's dog. The ringing out of his message should be setting into us an automatic reaction as to do what it is that we must do for the sake of the kingdom, with all long-suffering, denying ourselves, putting God first and our neighbor second, not forgetting that we were purged of our old sins. I have, you've probably heard me say this, but I, I, I make jokes when somebody, says, when somebody says, hey, have a nice day, or drive safe, I'll look at them and I'll say, I'll do what I want. You can't tell me what to do. Don't tell me how to live my life. I'll do what I want. And I think it's funny. Not everybody thinks it's funny. But it's, that's the problem, isn't it? We do what we want. If we sin, we desire to do that sin above our desire to remain right with God. If we are not keeping up with our responsibilities, it's because we want to do something else. It comes to denying ourselves. It comes to letting go of the things that we would desire selfishly, against authority and against God's will, against the gospel call, and against the Great Commission, and against the importance of education of ourselves for God's purposes. A person cannot accidentally succeed when it comes to Christianity, but he also cannot accidentally fail if he has God. What you truly desire to put into your effort is what you will, is what you will put into your effort. Whatever you desire to put into it is what will be put into it, and what you put into it is what you get out of it. No matter the sin, no matter the good work, if it is committed or neglected, what was done was out of the desire to put one value over another, or an action over abstinence. It is the difference between putting yourself first for the sake of pleasure or relaxation and putting God first, being theocentric, again, in mind, soul, and heart, with all effort that is given to us. I was selfish. 
I was selfish and I had no clue until it is I was told to study these verses and write a paper that basically became this sermon. And again, when I finished, I cried. I was spending so much time on what I wanted over what it is that God needed from me. I valued the relaxation, re relaxation of my own body over good quality study. I put myself in what I wanted over what I actually owed God. And I wasn't allowing myself to see it. Thankfully, I had time to realize this. And I also had an instructor who was willing to tell me to my face that I was the one thing that I was certain that I was not. I may have not gotten another chance to, to change. I may, not, I may have not gotten a chance to repent, and neither might you. If you are willing to give up yourself, finally, and live for Him, you can be baptized tonight if there's a need for that. If you know that you need to repent and come back to Him, it's time to do it. You know that you need to. So if you have a need, please, please come forward while it is that we stand together and while it is that we sing. Sinners, Jesus will receive. Sound this word of